1 Corinthians chapter 2. Yet among the mature we do speak wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we speak a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of this Ruler, none of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of this world, but the spirit of God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. And we speak this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to the spirit once. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are discerned in a spirit way. The spirit ones discern all things, but himself is discerned by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ." Let us pray. Lord, send your spirit in this place, that we may come to you and learn your ways, and that your word may go forth. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. One aspect of human life which always has fascinated me is perspective. If we started a discussion on what perspective is, we could chase it down a lot of rabbit trails related to the Enlightenment, the scientific method, reality, objective truth, and many other things. I will not torture you with that today. But suffice it to say, what I like about the concept of perspective is that people see things in different ways. This is due in part to the amalgamation of experiences and knowledge which each person possesses, and in part to where they are in relation to the object in question. Let me put it this way. What I say this morning will not be interpreted by each of you in exactly the same way. Although the hope is that each of you will take away the same basic message, there will be varieties of understanding. And those varieties come about because of your perspective. For example, some of you will not hear every word that I say. Maybe because you are at the stage in life where you have some hearing loss and therefore can't hear every word. Maybe some of you will have a child like mine screaming in your ear. And that will impede your ability to hear all of the words that I say. And in missing some of those words, you will not get the full picture or the full message. Another way to understand the perspectives is that uh, some of you have heard sermons on this passage before. And you will be filtering those sermons and what you have heard before. You'll be filtering my message through those experiences that you have had. And those of you who have had little exposure to this passage will not have those sorts of things already floating around in your head for comparison. Another example is that some of you have had different cultural experiences growing up in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. Those were different times and you were formed in different ways by those experiences such that now you filter experiences like this sermon through those times that you have had. And those of you who are younger and have had fewer cultural experiences will not necessarily uh, be filtering the message through those. 
And finally, of course, none of us was raised in exactly the same way, with the same family values or the same experiences, all of which things contribute to your understanding of the sermon today. See, perspective is perhaps the thing which most contributes to variety in our world. So knowing how pervasive perspective is, we can begin to see that one's perspective makes a lot of difference in life. And I might just say here at this moment that if your perspective overlaps enough with mine, you will agree with the things that I'm saying about perspective If you have a different perspective, you might disagree with what I've said. Perspective really comes into play when we talk about our actions. Why did you perform this action instead of that action? Well, you had a certain perspective based on knowledge, experiences, values, etc., which led you to believe that one action was preferable to another. Somebody else might not have made the same choice that you did because they had a different perspective. And this sort of thing happens every day all through the day. You can't get around it. And in fact, things become more complicated still when we start to analyze the outcomes of our actions. Was the choice that I made really the better choice? Who says one choice was better than another? Why do they say that one choice was better than another? And see, now we have the questions of competing perspectives, value judgments, goals to be achieved, and whether those goals really were achieved. What began as a seemingly easy decision has ballooned into a tangled mass of questions, all because of this thing that we call perspective. Perspective swirls through this next section of Paul's letter to the Corinthians as he continues with the themes which he already has shared to this point. Themes of the Corinthians' identity in Jesus Christ. Themes of wisdom. Themes of unity. Now we didn't dwell on the wisdom aspect last week. But recall that the reason for the Corinthians' division had to do with the fact that some were following The messengers rather than the message. The message being the gospel as revealed in Jesus Christ. Remember, the Corinthians believed that one messenger had more wisdom than another and that in turn they were wiser for following that specific person, recognizing that that person was the wiser teacher. They didn't understand that the wisdom of God was not found in humans and in human ways of doing things, but the wisdom of God was found in their crucified Messiah, Jesus Christ. In Him, no one is better than another. No one is wiser than another. And if they all had the same mind as Christ, they would be united in true wisdom. Well, Paul continues that message here, carrying it deeper by coming at it from a slightly different angle or perspective, if you will. And Paul's point today is wisdom depends on your perspective. Well, Paul begins by taking down the wisdom of the world, which some of the Corinthians had adopted. And he does this in three related ways. First, He describes the worldly wisdom as of this age and of the rulers of this age. This is apocalyptic language from the Jewish tradition which viewed salvation history in terms of distinct ages which followed after one another. And the present age is one in which evil reigns. God ultimately remains in control, but he has handed authority over to the worldly rulers. Revelation chapters 13 through 17 depicts this present age as the one in which the dragon and the beasts have authority over the inhabitants of the earth. On the one hand, then, 
Paul slights the worldly wisdom by associating it with evil. And on the other hand, Paul seeks to show how inadequate that worldly wisdom is, evil or not. You see, in contrast with the wisdom of this age, Paul declares that there is a secret wisdom from God which was before the ages. God's wisdom is superior because it has been around much longer. How good can the world's wisdom really be if it has only been around for so short a time? Now the second way that Paul diminishes the worldly wisdom is by declaring that, declaring that it soon will come to nothing. Naturally, to talk about the successive ages means that they will pass away until one comes to the final age. With the advent of Christ, the early church understood that the next age was beginning. And if the next age was beginning, then this one, this present age, is coming to an end. As we read elsewhere in Christ, God is making all things new. The old things are passing away and the new things have come. If we consider Revelation again, the present age, as depicted by the dragon and the beasts, eventually is overturned by God when he comes and destroys them. So Paul lets them know that the countdown has begun for the things of this age, including its wisdom. So here Paul subtly presents the question, why would you buy into something that is on its way out? Something that soon will be destroyed, something that is dwindling into nothingness. The worldly wisdom isn't going to last for long. Much better to ascribe to the wisdom of God, which was around long before the wisdom of this age and will be around long after this age is over. Now the third and final way in which Paul takes a swipe at the wisdom of this age is by pointing out what this wisdom did for those who follow it. If the worldly wisdom is so great, then why is it that the rulers of this world who possess that wisdom crucified the Lord of glory? Shouldn't they have recognized the Son of God? Shouldn't they have realized that they should follow him and his teachings rather than putting him to death as a criminal? Instead, it is clear by the actions of those who subscribe to the worldly wisdom, that it isn't much of a wisdom at all. The Corinthians may have some twisted understandings of the gospel and wisdom, but they have confessed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died on the cross. As Christians, then, they believe in this truth. And they should be able to see that any supposed wisdom which promotes crucifying Jesus is no real wisdom at all. Paul rather decisively makes the case that the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of this age, isn't worthwhile. It is limited. It is passing away and it clearly does not suffice to produce good results. Paul has painted the picture in such a way as to show that the wisdom of God in Christ Jesus is the preferred wisdom. That was something that the Corinthians had trouble understanding. And no doubt we have trouble with this sometimes as well. After all, as we noted last week, the wisdom which guides the world's perspective can seem pretty enticing because of its messengers and because of the promised results. Who doesn't want to be good-looking or wealthy or popular? Those are good things to be. Those are good things to want. 
And if we want those things, listening to the people who have them makes a kind of sense. The problem is that those things are things which are passing away, just as those people who have them will pass away. If they aren't lasting, then they are not ultimately worthwhile. Much better than to pursue the things that are worthwhile, the things that are found in God. We seek the things that cannot be shaken, things like eternal life with God. And to obtain those things will require not the world's wisdom, but God's wisdom. Now, if God's wisdom is what we want, Paul says that we will have to think like God. In other words, we will have to have God's perspective. As Paul makes clear The world couldn't see things from God's perspective. Already we know that they didn't recognize the Lord of glory. And Paul follows that up with a quotation from Isaiah, reinforcing that they neither could see nor hear nor comprehend what God has prepared for his people. And later in the passage, Paul shifts to talking about the natural person for whom the things of God are folly and indecipherable. All of this is the evidence that they can't see from God's perspective. And the reason is because only the Spirit of God can comprehend God's perspective. Only God in His Spirit knows God's wisdom, knows what God has prepared, knows what God is doing and has done and will do. And why? So how then are we to get God's perspective and not be just as blind and deaf and uncomprehending as the natural person, the person of the world? How can we be different than them in this respect? We have to receive the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God which imparts to us the thoughts and perspective of God. And indeed, we have received this spirit when we were baptized into Christ's death and raised with him from that death into new life. We who are in Christ are able to see from God's perspective and to have God's wisdom. Paul says near the end of this passage that the natural person, the person without the spirit, cannot discern the things of God. But the person with the Spirit is able to discern all things. That might seem like a bold claim to some of us. Because we live in a pretty confusing world at the moment. There are lots of issues which arise daily and which demand us to take a side in some way, to make an action for one side or another. There's a political firestorm constantly swirling into every corner of our country these days. There are people claiming that left is right and up is down. There are questions of who to trust, whom to love, who ought to be let in. There are questions of whether to support that cause or whether to oppose this one. And these sorts of things plagued the Corinthians just as they plague us And Paul is going to give answers just as we will explore answers for our own time. But the thing is, is that we won't be able to see these situations rightly. And we won't be able to understand God's answers for how to navigate these issues unless we are trying to see them from God's perspective. And thankfully, we have a whole book which tells us God's perspective. And the story of the crucified Messiah, the gospel, stands at the center of it all. This is our key to viewing the world rightly, to having the correct perspective on the things that are happening and what we're supposed to do. And Paul's kind of said that before, but he reinforces it here again because you've got to have the spirit 
You've got to have God's mind. And of course, the thing is, is that we don't always choose to live according to God's perspective and wisdom. And so the lesson this morning is a reminder and an encouragement to do just that. We have the Spirit of God, the teachings which God has given to us, and we have our Lord Jesus Christ to guide us. Let us lean into those things. Let us trust God's wisdom and perspective to lead us in the way we should go to obtain the truly valuable things in life. Because from the world's perspective, these things won't look like wisdom. Since the world, the rulers of this age, don't have the Spirit of God, they will think that it is folly to love our enemies. It is foolish to practice sex only within the bonds of marriage. It's silly for us to give our money and property to those who are in need. It's foolish to obtain, to abstain from practices which seem like pleasure, but which really can be snares of vice and addiction. The world can't make sense of a lot of the things that we do. And they think it's foolish, but we know that we are pursuing the kingdom of God. As we follow in God's ways. We know that we are pursuing the unshakable things of this world. We just have to remember that that's our goal. And that when issues arise which demand action on our part. Which demand us to take a side. That we look at them from God's perspective. And think in this moment. Is what I'm doing from God's perspective. Is it using God's wisdom and is it pursuing the things of God, the kingdom of God? If we live like that, we know that we have the mind of Christ and the wisdom of God. That's our goal this morning and every morning. If you are in need of prayer this morning for some problem in your life, we would be happy to pray for you. Please come forward, tell myself or one of the elders your struggle, and we want to pray for you. And if you have not yet become part of Jesus Christ, if you have not become baptized into him, where your sins are washed away and where you are raised into a new life, a life dominated by the mind of God, the Spirit of God, the mind of Christ, living from God's perspective, we want to invite you to do that today. Come and take that step. The waters are ready. We're ready to receive you just as God is. Won't you come as together we stand and sing.